that somehow the San Marcos Daily Record picked up, but no, it said this is a regular column by the San Marcos Daily Record, and sure enough, it was. Uh, for over 15 years, while Susan worked for the Daily Record, she wrote Notes in Passing. And now, as I look back in that title, I see that in that title, Notes in Passing, is the kernel of much of what Susan has written about throughout her life and what you get in the new book that she's here to read from. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about Susan before we, uh, before we hear from her and talk a little bit more about the book. She came to San Marcos in 1971, as many people first did to go to school here. She received a bachelor's and a master's degree. She began teaching at uh, the university formerly known as Southwest Texas State uh, in 1975 and has been teaching here since. Um, along the way, as I said, she wrote for the, uh, for the Daily Record. She also wrote for the news magazine, the weekly news magazine, the Chautauquan. And during those years, she won a number of major awards uh, for her column for the, da for the uh, Daily Record. In 1996, she began a new part of her career, and uh, that was as a, a lay minister for the Episcopal Church, an Episcopal, a lay Episcopal chaplain. And all along the way, she's continued to write and to think deeply about the relationship between writing and nature and the, the spiritual world. When I talk to my students about transcendentalism, you know, they have a, they have a hard time uh, understanding the transcendentalist. And I usually draw a little triangle. And at one corner of the triangle, I put nature. And at the other end, I put the writer. And then at the top, I put the oversoul or spirit or something like that. And I said that the writers, those transcendentalists like Thoreau and, uh, uh, and Emerson would look through nature and by, by communing with nature, they would get in touch with that spirit, that oversoul up there somewhere in the sky. Well, for Susan, it's not such a, a roundabout um, adventure. It is a more direct one, and that's where the, ter the title for her book, Icons of Loss and Grace, come from. And uh, I thought I would read you some of the comments that some of the, uh, the people have said about this book. It's hot off the press, uh, by the way, uh, and uh, there are, I think, five more copies back there. For those of you on the way, they say, are five more copies. So by the time we're through here, there will be at least five more this is what uh, John Talmadge uh, uh, says about the book. The power of this book lies as much in its moral vision as in the grace and elegance of the writing, a sure eye for telling details and memorable characters, human or wild, combined with deep spiritual vision, create moment after moment of intense, clarifying wonder. Few writers have drawn so much strength and wisdom from the natural world or shared it with such elegance and grace. And Scott Russell Sanders writes, whatever gives rise to the world gives rise to us, each in his or her own skin, in words laid down as carefully and handsomely as stones in a wall, Susan Hansen records half a lifetime of watching this elusive power at work. In the wilderness nearby, in a bird on the windowsill, a breath of wind, a, a heartbeat, a seed. And Scott Slovic, Slovic, our friend who used to, to uh, live and teach here, writes, I find myself dazzled by the humble, soft-spoken wisdom of this author. These gem-like essays are rooted in local and regional experience, and yet they explore the same deep and insurmountable questions that challenge nature writers everywhere in the world. Susan Hansen's words are invariably prescient and beautiful. And those, those comments, I think, uh, often lead to the, the oxymoronic thoughts that I have about, uh, about this collection. And that is that so you read these essays and you think about the gentle strength or the quiet force uh, in each one of them. And uh, there is irony in, uh, in, in much of those as well. I'm especially still moved by one of the essays uh, that also has the power of simplicity, another uh, oxymoron. And that's an essay called Why Write About Nature After the Death of a Child. 
That essay was a gift to a grieving family, and her writing is a gift to all of us. So I'm pleased to introduce Susan Hansen. Thank you, Mark. I didn't know I knew so many people. It's kind of scary. Um, Mark has, has told you a lot about this book already, but I want to give you a little more background about it. Um, one of my friends, Ellen, just asked, how long did it take you to write this book? And I kind of had to scratch my head and say, hmm, 20 years? I don't know. Um, Diana Finley here on the front row could probably tell you as well as I could because I worked with her during that whole time. Um, I guess to make the answer simpler, uh, it took me about a year and a half to put it together. Uh, there's some problems with the essays in this book, in a way, in that they're very short. Uh, because I had an editor who said, write short. <laughs> um, but, but that's what I like to do, I discovered. And that was fine um, until I started trying to, to market the thing, I guess. And people don't write short essays. And so I had to find a way to make them work together. And what I came up with was a collection with three parts. The first part is called Innocence, and as you would imagine, it's about um, just wonder and, and surprise and the things that, that I felt in nature before I guess I, I lost too much, I suppose. Uh, it's the way a child would see the world. The second section is called Loss, and it's not about anything dramatic. Uh, I wouldn't say anything in this book is dramatic. Uh, I don't go on any mountain treks. Um, you know, it, this is all stuff that's, that's right here in front of us. Um, the losses are losses we all have. Uh, losses as we get older, you know, our bodies don't work as well. Our, our ideals, perhaps, don't pan out. Um, people that we love die. And that was really probably the impetus for for a lot of that book, a lot of the book. Then the last section is entitled Grace. Um, like most people, I've, I've gotten through losses and they have turned into something that they weren't before. They've turned into something very powerful um, and very, um, let's say they, they helped me grow, put it that way. One thing this book is not, and that is, it's not a, a, a fix-it book. It's, it's not going to tell you, okay, you've lost something, but buck up. It's going to get good, you know. Uh, bad things happen, but, you know, they happen for a reason. I think that's bunk. So, um, having said all of that, I want to read a little bit from it. And what I'm going to do is read um, an essay or so from each section, just to kind of give you an idea of the, the progress of the book. One of the, um, I'll just say this before I read the first one, one of the places where a number of these essays take place is a retreat center in South Texas called Leb Shemaya. It's a place I went for nine spring breaks in a row. Uh, it's a wonderful place. It's um, about 1,100 acres of just wild Texas scrub with trails through it. And, and I would always go in March when the, the birds were migrating. And it was just heaven down there. Uh, and nobody could talk either, and so it was an introvert's dream to go there. <laughs> um, and you would run into the most interesting people, people who were, uh, they had come maybe to just start their lives over, or they were on a break like I was from teaching, or who knows what. And this particular essay I'm going to read mentions somebody who I kind of ran into almost literally while I was there. This is called The <clears throat> Excuse me, the act of attention. She is doing Tai Chi in the middle of the path. What is the proper etiquette for this, I wonder? Do I stand here pretending to admire the bark of the nearest tree? Do I ignore her and simply walk right by, training my eyes on the ground ahead? I am stumped, I'll admit, and more annoyed than I care to say. 
Young and thin, the woman appears to be very much at home with herself. Like me, she has been at this South Texas retreat center for several days now. But unlike me, she wears a certain lightness, a grace that bespeaks a kind of inner calm. I am wearing a backpack full of books. Pausing on the sandy path that winds some two miles through the trees, I watch her for a moment, watch her standing with her arms raised in the air like wings. She has become a crane. Not knowing how long she will pose there, readying herself for flight, I decide I have no choice but to slip discreetly by. Holding my camera close against my chest and keeping my eyes on the path, I follow the wheel rut to the right. I am careful not to make a sound, not to let my clothing rustle, not to breathe more loudly than I should. The woman simply stands there, motionless and mute. What annoys me, I realize as I walk, is that this woman's practice isn't mine. Lissom as the saplings growing underneath the oaks, she has a grace I envy, a composure I imagine that I lack. Somehow, I suspect, her way of working toward the center of her life is far more enlightening than mine. Rounding the corner and passing a deer trail through the brush, I watch for the sign that will mark a pathway to my left. For several mornings now, I have taken this detour to a pond beyond a mott of oaks and palms. And for several mornings, I have waded through the young spring grass set up my camp stool just behind a screen of reeds and waited for the birds. On my first day here, I encountered several blue-winged teals, the male distinguished by the stripe of white between his bill and eyes. Gliding back and forth across the pond, the birds seemed oblivious not only to the turtle sunning on the muddy bank, but also to the weeds-crested flycatcher snatching insects as it tumbled through the air. This morning, though, there are no ducks. I find a colony of cormorants instead. Five cormorants are swimming in the pond today, I note in the journal I hold balanced on my lap. Five cormorants, like a haiku skimming the surface, grinning apostrophes on water. While I am not looking, they all get out, flex their wings, and then run back into the water like children, splashing one another as they go. If it weren't anthropocentric to say so, I'd say these creatures were in love with the lives they lead. Taking a closer look, I see that my count is wrong. There are 10, not five, I write at the bottom of the page. Cormorants on holiday, I guess. A comical lot, these birds wear perpetual grins. With their upturned bill and their bills and their snake-like necks, they ride low in the water like loons. It seems fitting, then, to read in my 1951 Audubon Water Bird Guide that when double-crested cormorants are first hatched, the naked, coal-black young look like rubber toys. They're not much different now. Perched on my stool and out of their line of sight, I make a small confession in my book. I feel a bit like a voyeur, I write as a final note sneaking up on a group of bathers, skinny dipping in the pond. Leaving the birds to their play, I fold up my stool, place my journal in my pack, and head back down the trail the way I came. Best not to be too quiet, I think, padding silently on the sand. In the grass at the edge of the path, a javelina stares at me, turns and trots into the brush on stiff-legged tiptoe. Within minutes, I am veering past a pile of deer dung on the trail. Instead of walking on, though, I stop to watch a pair of beetles as they, beetles struggling to carry a single pellet away. Ignoring the shadow of my boots, they roll it toward a clump of straggler daisies near the path. And there, while I stoop to see exactly how they work, they bury the dung in the sand. What is my practice? I wonder, as I think back to the young woman on the path, what is authentic life for me? All too often, I've imagined that the answer lay in reading the right book, finding the right program, emulating the right spiritual guide, 
but I found it in none of these. In a key episode in his novel, The Dharma Bums, Jack Kerouac follows writer Jaffe Henry Morley and narrator Ray Smith as they attempt to ascend a mountain in the Sierra Nevada. After a day of climbing has taken them to the foot of Matterhorn Peak, the trio must decide whether to continue toward the summit or begin the descent toward camp. Smith and Jaffe elect to go on. Novice climber that he is, Smith has been duly impressed by the grace and agility with which ja Jaffe leaps from rock to rock. Earlier, in fact, he had tried to copy his friend's technique, finally realizing that he would be more successful if he were simply to, quote, pick his own boulders and make a ragged dance of his own. It is only on the way down, however, that Smith actually gets it. Having clambered almost to the top of the Matterhorn, he makes his descent with joyful abandon, intuitively creating his route through the rocks as he goes. All of a sudden, Smith exclaims, everything was just like jazz. No longer worried about how his performance compares to Jaffe's, he is at last free to experience his life as his own. Like the jazz musician, Smith is finally letting the music come, naturally flowing from a center that is deep within himself. What might my life be like if I were to give in to the rhythm of my own ragged dance? Like this, I imagine, walking down the trail, past grapevines and wine cups and wee satch blooming in the sun. Just like this attentiveness, this pleasure, this being present to the world. The next one I'd like to read is called The Infinite Set. Um, and this is from the section on loss. Um, and it, more than probably any essay in the book, really reflects um, the response that a lot of us have, I think, when we look around the natural world and see things disappearing or see things being um, compromised in some way. The Infinite Set. 1,500 miles from here, on the side of a mountain in Colorado, a yellow-bellied marmot runs across a hiking trail, stops at the base of a large rock, and begins digging for food in the loose dirt. Sitting nearby in the grass, a woman draws her knees up under her chin and watches in silence. In her mind, this meadow, this quadrant on the Forest Service map, has suddenly become the universe. For an instant or two, there is nothing in her life but the marmot, the grass, the trail that stretches out ahead of her and disappears into a grove of aspen. Closing her eyes, the woman imagines a different scene. She is in the mind of the marmot. And what she sees is herself, only farther away and smaller. She is somewhere on the periphery of things, superfluous in the world of the marmot. When she leaves this meadow 45 minutes from now, the marmot will imagine that she has ceased to be. He will not wonder where she is going or if she is happy or if she has any life apart from him. Instead, he will continue digging in this patch of dirt and when it begins to rain later in the day, he will hide underground and imagine that he is alone in the universe. In a small town in Texas, the woman sits in her study, listening to a thunderstorm rolling in from the west and struggling to remember a cool meadow far away on the side of a mountain. Tonight, her universe is a room lined with brown bookshelves, a cursor blinking at her from a computer screen, a dog scratching half-heartedly on a closed door. 1,500 miles away, Darkness is settling across the western slope of the Rockies. And as it falls, a yellow-bellied marmot whistles to his mate across a field of boulders. By thinking of the marmot, the woman can almost see what he sees, hear what he hears. Imagining herself in his place, she can almost feel 
the wind ruffling the fur on the back of his thick neck. The marmot cannot imagine her. Because she is a human being and not a creature living on the side of a mountain, the woman knows certain things. Without having to see him, she knows that she is linked inextricably to the marmot and to a million other small lives across the planet. And without having to leave this room, she knows that her world intersects not only his, but another and another, the infinite set. Roughly 80 miles north of Corpus Christi, Texas, a man is fishing in Lavaca Bay. What he doesn't realize is that for more than 20 years, the local Alcoa plant discharged large quantities of mercury into this section of the bay. He knows nothing of the benzene and the tulene, the chloroform and the PCBs that have been found in the bay's sediment, as well as in the shallow groundwater not far from the shore. And he is unaware that Calhoun County, where Alcoa operates along with Formosa Plastics and other industries, was designated in the late 1980s as one of the 10 most polluted counties in the nation. In short, what he doesn't realize is that any fish he catches in this area of the bay, black drum, speckled sea trout, redfish, will likely be contaminated with mercury. First link between something and nothing. In May of 2003, the woman reads, two lowland gorillas were rescued from the pet trade in Nigeria and returned to their native Cameroon. Captured in 1995 as infants, the endangered animals, named Brighter and Twiggy, were released to live with other primates in the world-famous Limbe Wildlife Center. To the poachers who had captured the baby gorillas and killed their mothers to sell as bush meat, they were commodities worth as much as $250,000 each. To their owner, they were a symbol of status and wealth. To the Nigerian government, they were a rare success story. And what are they to themselves? Like the marmot and the woman sitting in her study, each is the center of a small universe. Sitting in her study with its brown bookshelves and its forest green walls, the woman imagines herself in the mind of an infant gorilla stripped from the arms of her dying mother. First link between something and nothing. On the northwest side of San Antonio, members of the Citizens Tree Coalition protest a new development on the frontage road of Interstate 10. While the demonstration is still in progress, crews begin to bulldoze what the local press has referred to as numerous good-sized trees including one with a trunk measuring three feet across. A McDonald's and a Chevron station will be built to take their place. Listening to the storm outside her window, the woman closes her eyes and thinks of places she has never seen, of oceans and deserts and mountains without trails. Tilt the globe just so, she realizes, and each becomes the center of the world the most important place on earth. Look at the universe just right and nothing is expendable. On the side of a mountain in Colorado, a marmot falls asleep and dreams he is alone. 1,500 miles away, in a room lined with books, a woman hears him breathing. plan to read this particular essay, but since Mark mentioned it and since it answers a question that I think is important, uh, <laughs> it gives me a chance to get a drink. Yeah. Um, anyway, the, <clears throat> excuse me. This book, this particular essay answers a question. <laughs> It answers a question that someone in this room asked me some years ago. And the question was, why do you write about nature? Um, 
this was a very good exercise for me to, to, to do because I needed to know, you know, why do you write about bugs and, and birds and things like that? And it happened, as Mark said, that the child of a good friend had just died. And somehow the two sort of came together for me. This is an essay for Pablo, who lived less, he lived just over a month. Lilac and gold, the flowers of autumn rise resplendent from the brittle grass. Gay feather and goldenrod, frost weed and sunflower golden eye. They shine against the backdrop of a gray, soft focused sky. It is just after first light on this stretch of Texas highway, and the spray from the whooshing tires sings against the bottom of the car. Rising from bed at six on a Saturday morning, I had grumbled about getting such an early start. But here on the empty road now, I'm content, glad for the taste of solitude. This drive toward the coast is one I've made at least a hundred times. And because I once saw a patch of Michaelmas daisies in bloom beside the porch of a weathered house, I find myself glancing in that direction each time I pass. Today, though, the yard is empty, save for a rusty pickup parked beneath the branch of an ample oak. What can be said for such a landscape? What can be made of the simple fact that where liatris blooms this fall, we such will blossom in the spring. Change is a measure of time, and in the autumn, time seems speeded up. Edwin Way Teal writes in October. What was is not, and never again will be. What is, is change. Why write about nature? A friend asked me not long ago. Why say what seems so obvious to the eye? It is not for lack of imagination that she finds this habit odd or for lack of appreciation of the earth. It is the weight of words that puts her off, I suspect. The burden of language on what should be known by sense alone. Why write about nature? The question recurs as I drive through the fog of an autumn morning. Is it not enough to see the harrier, the marsh hawk, perched atop the telephone pole, to feel the touch of velvet leaf mallow against my skin, to smell the dampness of the pungent earth. Must I write of these things as well? I must. It makes them more real, I told my friend ineptly when she asked. That is part of the answer, but only part. Physical being that I am, I know the world primarily as it comes to me through my fingertips. I know it through the polished surface of a snail shell, the nubby cap of an acorn, the density of wet clay. Piece by piece, I collect the parts, assembling it as I go. But what of that hidden life, that life that exists beyond my grasp? It is no less real, I suspect, and yet when I try to give it form or weight or color, it disappears, ethereal as sunlight. Holding just the memory of its brilliance, I am rendered mute and blind, senseless in the face of a mystery I can't speak. Shall I call it transience, mutability, loss? If so, what is its shape? How will I know it when I look it in the eye? Creature of sinew and soul, I feel my life go deeper, underground, potato-like, spreading out beneath me in a web of roots. Sightless, I can only sense what this other self must know. Along an empty highway, an hour south of my home, a stand of Maximilian sunflowers blazes out against a hedgerow of elm and oak. All the more beautiful for their unexpectedness, they will bloom for a week or two and fade, turning brittle in the first November chill. How does the intellect perceive impermanence and change? How does it comprehend the fact that a life can flourish for a season, die, and vanish like the morning fog? Fragility, evanescence, the delicacy of beauty brought too swiftly to an end, 
What the mind rejects, the body surely knows. Why write about nature? Spirit and flesh, I am nonetheless part of the earth, and earth it is that teaches me the mysteries of love and loss. How can I understand that what is absent is not gone, that what has ended is not finished, that what is taken is returned as more than memory? I can't. What I can do, though, is listen for the sound of the sandhill cranes flying high above my house this fall, feel the supple shoots of next spring's flocks, memorize the curve and hue of Michaelmas daisies in full bloom. What I can do is live, is live as though beauty matters, as if its imprint on the soul never fades. I'm going to read just a couple more. Um, this one is um, one I had planned to read, and in a sense it isn't as directly connected to nature as the, the one I just finished. Um, but there is a bit of it in there. And anyway, this is sort of the anchor essay, I guess, for, for this section of the book. It's called The Scent of Sycamores. This is what you do, I think, as I kneel beside my mother's driveway pulling spikes of grass from her bed of moss rose and heather. This is what you do when there is nothing to be done. For a week now, I have watched as my mother has grown smaller and more frail. For a week now, I have watched as layer upon layer of her public self has dropped away, leaving a hard kernel of memory and love. They think it's cancer, my sister had said when she called just two weeks before. It doesn't look good, and it wasn't. Seven years after our father's death from the same disease, we're back on the cancer ward, back on the floor where families gather in twos and threes at the ends of hallways, or stand whispering among themselves outside an open door. It is surprising how quickly we fall back into the rhythm of pain and loss. Two weeks ago, I was pulling weeds in the garden, my mother says, sounding slightly more puzzled than angry. Today, it is all she can do to move from the bed to the chair. Tomorrow, it will be all she can do to sit up. That's the way things go sometimes. One day, you're cheering at your granddaughter's high school graduation, the next, you're wondering about that pain you've had since Easter. No sirens, no bells, just the certain swift unraveling of all you've ever been. I feel just like a baby, my mother says on her second day home from the hospital. I know, I tell her, though I can't really know at all. Forced to return to the hospital the following day, my mother wears the weary look of one betrayed betrayed by a body she knows is giving out. It is Monday when one of the nurses tells us that our mother may not last the week. It is Tuesday evening when she dies. It is as simple and as utterly complex as that. I have imagined, for some reason I can't understand, that writing about my mother's death would be easy, that the words would simply flow unchecked, Instead, just the opposite has occurred. To sit with someone during the last two weeks of her life, to watch her weaken and to listen as she breathes her final breath, to do these things, I have discovered, is to be in a place you have never been before. It is real, all right, but like walking in space or landing on the moon, it has no equivalent on Earth. Coming back, you might as well say that you've learned to eat fire or that you know what it is to have lead for bones. The experience is just that strange and just that impossible to describe. You are different now, you realize, but not in ways that anyone can see. Rising from your desk to get a cup of coffee, you expect someone to stop you in the hall and say, quite matter-of-factly, I noticed that you've lost a leg, or 
Your hair has turned to rivulets of ice, but no one does. What then can be said? Only that you have been to the center of the earth and come back, alive but shaken. Only that you have lost your moorings and been set adrift on a windless sea. Humankind cannot take very much, cannot bear very much reality, you remind yourself, recalling T.S. Eliot's words. And so you tend to speak in metaphors, in a language that carries the truth inside itself like an embryo. One day you will hold it, but not today. For now you are doing well to grasp at images, to imagine the notes of a familiar song, or to catch the fragrance of vanilla rising from someplace in the back of your mind. Robbed of reason, you become a creature of sense again, running your bare fingers through her sandy flower bed, breathing the scent of sycamore in the center of her small yard. We Americans don't know how to deal with death, her doctor says, as we sit around a table at the end of a quiet hall. We haven't learned to see it as part of the cycle. Just as we have lost a mother tonight, he has lost a patient and a friend. I need this as much as you, he says, of the nearly two hours we will spend together talking. It is a way of getting through the night. In the days that follow, there will be other ways of working through our grief. Standing in my sister's kitchen, we will speak of the nurses who salved our mother's spirit as well as tending to her pain. We will hug our friends and eat their homemade casseroles. We will tell old stories and watch the moon rising brightly over the bay behind the house. One quiet afternoon, a day or two after her death, I will make a new compost pile in the corner of the lawn. Before the week is out, each of us, my brother, my sister, and I, will claim a special keepsake to carry home. For one of us, it will be the little calendar she kept in an envelope in her drawer, the calendar our father used to mark off the days until their wedding. For another, it will be a chipped pie plate or her ragged copy of Anna Karenina. More important, each of us will carry with us what we found best in her her quirky sense of humor, her questioning mind, her sense of fairness and loyalty, her love of the earth, her faith. It will take time, friends remind us. You have to give it time. And so for now, we let our grief wash over us like salt water on an open wound, welcoming the pain as a sign that healing has begun. I'd like to read one more, and this, this last one will be from the section called Grace. Um, and then if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. This one is called Lo Learning to Love the World. <coughs> Coffee cup in one hand, notebook in the other. I am sitting in the archway of an open-air stone chapel, astonished by the morning. For 20 minutes now, I have been watching a host of bar barn swallows sweeping across the dry brown field in front of me, ascending and descending, not on wings, but of will, on will. Seeming hardly to move their lithe bodies, they rise and fall on waves of imagination, on sunlight, on energy from the earth itself. Their flight, arcing and dipping like the sound of conversation from another room, they glide past me, unbidden and unearned. They are the simple graces of the morning, these birds that come as unfailingly as dawn. Taking a sip of coffee, I set down the cup and reach for my binoculars. Across the narrow asphalt road, I have noticed, a large ash juniper has come alive with birds. Titmouse, cardinal, house finch, mockingbird, scissor-tailed flycatcher, Buick's wren, starling, and weaving through them all the fight flight of a pair of eastern kingbirds. They are the extravagances of the morning, these birds that spin themselves like fire, like everything, that like everything beautiful, blaze up, then disappear. At the base of the tree, in a patch of black, bare earth, a single titmouse has emerged to wrestle with a golden leaf. 
Barely larger than its prey, the bird picks up an edge and shakes it, picks it up and shakes it. Unsuccessful in wresting the object from the ground, the titmouse finally flits away to, a, to the tree again, twittering as it flies. The leaf still flutters in the dirt. Is it the wind that moves it? Some force I can't see? What looks like a leaf, I realize at last, is in fact a giant moth. So, I ask myself, do I move it, save it, take it someplace where it won't be threatened by the birds? Resisting the urge to rescue another creature's breakfast, I watch from a distance as the moth twitches for a moment more, then lies completely still. Finally, however, I have to come in closer, have to look, have to bend and stroke the mauve brown pattern on its velvet wings. It quivers at my touch. What I am looking at, I discover, is an imperial moth. Easily recognized by its large size and yellow wings, my guidebook tells me, variably spotted and shaded with pinkish, orangish, or purplish brown. Even as I make note of its symmetry and size, I know that there is no forgetting such a sight. Wings spanning a good 13 centimeters, wings the essence of yellow. Could anything be so bright? so delicate, so bold. They are the audacity of the morning, these wings that dare to call attention to themselves. Crouching beside the tree, hands resting on my thighs, I watch as the moth moves away from me and skitters toward a patch of brittle grass. In a second, it will be out of my field of vision, and I will turn my attention to the sound of a canyon wren trilling in the trees behind me. Attention. What more do I have to give the world than that? What more can I do than say, this matters? Listen, look, engage. What more is there to do? Walking along the asphalt road, walking toward a waterfall of wind song spilling from the trees, I sense that I have made a choice. I have given my assent, my attention, to what is wild, what is beautiful, what is out of my control? I have said, this matters. A year ago, when this place was empty of people, I sat on a bench in the open air chapel, reading poetry to the caretaker's dog. Stretched out across the flagstone floor, her head between her paws, the ancient lab appeared to listen as I went from one poem to the next. I should have felt silly, I suppose, reading Mary Oliver that way, but I didn't. There is one question I read when I came to the lines entitled Spring, how to love this world. One question. I think of that phrase now as I stand in the brilliance of another August morning, cloudless sky above me, dusty ground below. How do we love the world? Like this, just like this, sitting in the archway of an open air chapel, touching the wing of a moth, tracing the flight of birds, burrowing below the skin of things, emerging with dust between my toes. Do you have any questions? take notes and come back. Um, to be honest, I usually don't know what it means yeah. until I, I come back and think about it. Um, your question, though, about putting myself in the essays, I think is a, a valid one, too. Um, there are nature writers who don't do that. In fact, there are nature writers who are very strict about not putting anything in that's not, quote, natural. Uh, once I was reading an essay at a conference some years ago, Afterward, um, I thought everything was fine, you know. One of my fellow panelists came up to talk after, as you do, 
And he said, I don't think that was a nature essay. I said, oh, okay, why? Because you have a, tr a truck in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I beg to differ with him. But yeah, I'm in all of them. And um, I write them after, much after. Are we not natural then? Yeah, well, that's, a, that's yeah. an issue. Yeah. Right <laughs> When you were writing your column, you had regular opportunities to write these kinds of essays. Do you mm -hmm. find the same opportunities now that you make them? Or? No, I don't. <laughs> um, I found that there's a real blessing in having a deadline. So maybe I need to get Diana to call me once a week and say, are you finished yet? <clears throat> there are times you know, that come up, like a conference or you know, something that happens that I need to write something for, but it's not as easy. Uh, and it's something that I have to do all the time um, for it to work. And I'm, I'm gra gradually getting back into it, though. For the book, are some of these new? Or the some of them are. All of them have been redone. So even if you read them the first time, they're going to be different, almost all of them. Um, some were things I wrote for conferences, or some are essays put together that weren't originally put together. So it's, it's different, yeah. Denise. How you how you're able to think so lucidly in clear, uncluttered language. I mean, ever since you were little, you were trying to <laughs> try to That's analyze interesting question. Were um, you encouraged to do that at the dinner table? No, I no, I was not encouraged to do it at all. Um, <laughs> encouraged I was encouraged to finish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's a difficult question. Um, one of the things that, that might help answer the question is that when I was in college, I, I was a poet. That's what I did. I wrote poetry. And then after I finished my thesis, I couldn't write any more poetry. And so I started writing prose, but using the techniques of poetry. And that's explained in the introduction to the book. Um, I'm very caught up with the way things sound. With the way language sounds and with precision and with trying to just say a lot and not many words. And I think that's a function of reading and writing poetry. But it's still rooted in, in the common idiom. It's not yeah. I wear the trousers on my bed, uh, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah common it's, idiom. It's, and the other answer to your question was I was a, I'm an introverted person, yeah. if you didn't know that. Because I, you know, I would be real happy to be in the other room right now, looking at the pictures. Um, and I, I was outside all the time, and that's what introverted kids do. You know, they just. And I was very nearsighted too, which I think helped. <laughs> you know, um, and I talk about that in the introduction too. You have to look at things very closely if you're nearsighted. In fact, Ann Zwinger, who's a nature writer, has a book called *The Nearsighted Naturalist*, which is kind of. A, Theme, I guess. Dick? Uh, you had a great deal of difficulty, I assume, deciding which essays to put in and which essays to leave out. Part two of my question is, uh, <laughs> are there plenty of essays out there for another book with a different focus, a different emphasis? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't done the math, but 15 years times, you know, one a week, some of them were just flippant, you know, and they were fun, but you know, nothing that I want to put in a book. You that canoe expedition. <laughs> it's it's in here actually. In here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Connie. Since you started as a poet, and I'm assuming that you, your prose is influenced by certain poets, so is, are there ones that, that that influence your nature writing, or or do you find that other nature writers I, other nature writers. Um, you know, I always tell my students to imitate people you like. That's what you do anyway. And and I can read through my stuff. Not that it's you know, word, but the rhythms are the same or something like that. But definitely not other nature writers. And it's a small number of people. Scott Russell Sanders is one. Um, others. Well, please uh, stop outside.
happening. So let's see if there are any more books out there. Uh, Susan will sign books out, and there are refreshments out there as well. Uh, all coming in.